Well, good morning and welcome. So glad that you're all here today to worship with us. It's another wonderful day in the Lord. Amen. Amen. I do. Uh, there's. A, I only have one hand now, so I can't pull it out. But inside that yellow flyer that you got, there's a communication card. And that's an opportunity for you to share with us what God has laid on your heart. You can pull it out at any time. See, there's a space there for your name and uh, whatever contact information you feel comfortable giving with us at this time. But really, your name and your email address, if you already filled one of them out, is all that we need. But you'll see that, that God will be speaking to you throughout the service. There will be an opportunity after the message as well for you to reflect and write down what God has laid on your heart <clears throat> at that time. We're celebrating the Lord's Supper uh, today. And uh, if you have not received the communion cup, they're at the back as you walk in. And uh, so let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to once again to gather and worship. We pray, Lord, that you're, you settle our spirits, that you open our hearts and our eyes to you, Lord that we may walk out of this place refreshed and renewed with a new vision of you. For this we pray in your name. Amen. You stand as we join together once again and as we sing together. Oh, <laughs> 
It's the same now. The enemy underestimates us. He doesn't know what we are. He doesn't know what we can do when Christ has been us. He has no idea. And, and, and neither do those who work for him. They underestimate us. We are the people of God. We are able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? Amen? Of course we can. God knows what he has in us. But I wonder this. I ask you this. When we come before God with our requests and things that we make known to him, the Bible says in, in Philippians 4, with all supplication, with all supplication, that means when we come with supplication, we've done all we can. Amen? With all supplication, make a request known. And with thanksgiving, I tell my brother and I say, hey, if you want to move the hand of God, you've got to learn to ask according to his will. You've got to ask according to his will. I remember when I was a boy, before I went to my father with something, there were certain things I had to do. There were certain things I had to supply. I remember I wanted to get my first car. And, and it was a Firebird. No, it was a Trans Am. A couple of years ago, I think it was an 85 Trans Am. And I wanted this car because my brother had this car and he went on to get a Cadillac. I wanted this car. My father said, Nico, that's too much car for you. I said, but dad, it's too much car for you. Mm -hmm. So I learned, I said, you know what? I have to ask according to his will, not according to mine. I didn't have the money. I didn't have a license. I didn't have the insurance. I didn't have the prerequisites, amen, to ask according to what my father's favor would agree to. And I knew him. I knew his M.O. He was my father. Amen. So I knew what it. I said, the next time I ask him, I'm going to have a down payment. I'm going to have a job. I'm going to have a license. I'm going to have insurance. I'm going to be making good grades in school. And I'm going to be giving my third to the house. Because I have to give a third of my paycheck to the house no matter what. No matter what. My father stood there with little hat, little bracelet. Every time we got paid, he stood there. We had to come in and give a third of what we made to the house. Period. He said, responsibility comes with privilege. You want to have a car, you want to have this, you want to have that, you got to give to the house first. The house first. It's like that in our tithes and offerings sometimes, huh? You got to give to God when it's God's, amen? And I learned this. I learned, I learned, I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta manage this a different way. So what I did is I did all those things. Supplication. Everything I knew to do. Everything I knew to do. And then, and then once I had supplied all these things, then I came before my father and I asked him, but not for the same car, for a different car, a less of a car. It was a 1979 Pontiac Sunbird. It's white with tin windows and it had an Alpine stereo system. <laughs> Real nice. See, I, before I asked my father, I already knew. I already knew what it is that he would require of me before I did this. And when I asked him, he said, no, that's the car for you. It was a little car, it was a little V, it was a little V6. Was it a floor? I don't remember. It was a nice little car. But when I learned to ask my father in accordance with his will, I already knew what his answer was going to be. Because I already supplied everything that I was supposed to supply. It's like that with our Heavenly Father. He says in all supplication, do everything that you can to follow my will, to serve me, to worship me, to be my people. My people can ask me for anything that they want, for anything that they need, as long as it's according to to my will. A lot of people will say, well, that's not fair. Why would I ask according to his will? Because he is infinitely smarter than we are. <laughs> like my father was. Ah, oh, he's all wet, but he knew. He knew my father in heaven knows. He knows me better than I know myself. He knows you better than you know yourself. But it's a matter of trusting him. Jesus said, Lord, let your will be done and not mine. We should start our prayer every time the same way. Thank you, Lord, Amen. for the forgiveness of my sin and the salvation of my soul. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then it should be, Lord, have your way. Regardless of what I ask, let it be according to your will. That's what Jesus did. No matter the trial, no matter the trouble, no matter the passion he felt and had or what was about to happen, no matter the weight, the burden, he said, Lord, let your will be done. Let your will be done and not mine. What a sacrifice that is. What a heart for God that is. What a mind for Christ that is. And we should be no less. 
people in the old, the prophets and those that came in the Old Testament, they didn't have Jesus. They didn't have the New Testament in blood. They didn't have it. We do. We do. We have a point of reference. We have a point of origin for everything that we ask God for. But we must remember, it must be according to His Word, according to His purpose, according to His plan. All things work to the good of God. All things work to the good of God. And for those who seek His will and purpose for them. Look at the requisites here. There are prerequisites. We love to say, everything works for me and for my good. Because I seek the will and purpose for my life according to God, right? But do we really? Do we really? Have we, have we let God be the judge of that? Have we let His measure be our measure? Has we let His way search our ways? Are we being pruned? Are we being disciplined? Are we being marched to, to, to the mark? Although we're fitting the prerequisites, are we truly and verily seeking His will and His purpose for our lives? Listen, to do that, number one, you have to surrender. That's number one, your own ways, your own will. We must deny ourselves to be coming before the Lord. We must have that prerequisite, that pre-state, that pre-set in mind, in body and in spirit, to put our own will aside and consecrate ourselves for the will of God, for His intended purpose for each and every one of us. Go ye therefore and make disciples. Go ye for there, preach and teach in all of, in all of the world, everywhere. Yes. Yes, here, there, and everywhere. Coming to church is not a prerequisite. There really isn't. Being the church is. Being the church is a requisite. Loving obedience is a requisite. Mm. It's something that counts in the heavens. Our passions, our desires, our wants, our fears, our hopes, our doubts. No, it's the prerequisite of God's will in our life that we hunger and thirst for. We've already seen what doesn't work. We were selfish. We were prideful. We were jealous. We were demand our own way. Nothing works that way. I can't come to church on Sunday and live like the rest of the week. I've got to live out my life. This is just one day. I can sit in the pew and worship and sing and preach and teach. But if it doesn't translate into my real life, to my everyday life, what's it all for? What's it all for? I will share something with you today. My chaplain from the Sadaos of Useful Minister, I'm a chaplain as well, but he's my elder chaplain. He's my Paul and I'm his Timothy, amen? He passed this weekend. He died of COVID. A beloved teacher, my high counsel, my beloved friend. And I was studying the word and he died and I've been, we've been praying and we've been seeking the Lord for his healing and he passed away. But this was a man of God. This was a reverent, upstanding, ground approach, man of God. And as they sought God's word and said, Lord, how does this work to the good of God? For us who seek your will and purpose for them. He said, Daniel, he's in, he's in glory with me. I don't have to ask permission to take him. He's mine. And I'll take him when I see fit. I remember my wife had COVID and my daughter had COVID. It was a very serious time for me. They were sick. It was a bad situation. Amen. And I stood over my wife and I prayed for her for three days. And I said, Lord, do your will. With tears in my eyes and a heavy heart, I said, Lord, do your will. She belongs to you. She always has. You know how much I need her. You know how much I love her. You know what you have in her. Lord, do your will. That was hard to ask that. It was hard to do that. It was hard to say, Lord, she's yours. And I had to say the same thing with my daughter because she was sick too. And I said, Lord, do your will. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do. Was to give my life, my wife and her life, and everything in it over to the working of God's plan. Lord, how can this work to the good of God? And for me, you are seeking what it purpose for me. And I had that question in my mind, and I had that in my heart when my, when my beloved friend Tori died. And he said, he goes to glory, and you all will be there soon. I have a purpose and plan that you don't understand right now. Carry on. Preach, teach, do all the things Tori taught me to do. Do all the things Tori taught me to do to honor God. Because if you honor God, you honor Tori. Amen. Mm -hmm. I love the man. And now I have to live without him. I don't have that counsel anymore. 
I have great counsel. I have Robert. I have my pastor. I have Jonathan. I have David. I have Kate. I have my wife. I have Nate. And I have, I have Anna for my counsel. But this man was an elder. He taught me for years. He taught me this for years. And now he's gone. And I asked myself, Lord, who will fill his shoes? And he said, you're looking at me. Come forth and be the kind of champion that Troy was. We need an image to live by, an example to go by. That example is Jesus, amen? But Tory, Tory, I call him my big bear. Elder Tory. He really ran the race. He really did. He was a man beyond reproach. By all who knew him, there were pictures all over Facebook by him. And there was one picture that I saw there. He sat there with his grandson, a little child of color. He himself is, is an animal. And he's sitting there on the street stump, and he's holding that boy, and they're talking. And I think to myself, man, that was Tory. And I felt like that little boy sitting next to him, my counsel, my friend, who taught me for many years. And, I, and I'm searching, I'm saying, Lord, how does this work? How does it work to the good God? And he says, all things are not made known to you now, but they will be later. He said, it's hard for me to hear what God is saying when I'm brokenhearted. But I thank God for his patience. I thank God for the work of his resolve to stay with me in the heartache and the trial and the travail. And wait till I set her down and wait till I calm myself so that he can speak to me more clearly, so I can hear him more clearly. Amen? Are we listening today? Are we listening today that all good things work to the good of God for those who seek his will and purpose for them? Can you say that? And everything that you do, everywhere you go, everyone who knows you, if you're at the thrift store, if you're in the pantry, if you're here, if we're at Crosspoint ministry, can you say that? Can you say you're truly and verily seeking His will and His purpose for your life? Because if you're not, you simply cannot expect everything to work for you. You simply cannot, you cannot confuse the two. You cannot separate the two. You must be in the will of God in order for everything to work for you. What is the will of God, we ask? Saved by grace through faith in Christ. Loving obedience, prayer, worship, service, honor, gratitude. These are the will of God. These are the things that we should embody as we represent the kingdom, as we represent the church. Love and service should be on our minds all the time. Not just here and not just there, but all the time. The best way to test yourself that way is when you get behind the wheel. Amen. Everybody driving like crazy. I had a guy this morning driving in front of me. And I swear he was driving two miles an hour. <laughs> and the first thing I said to my man, I just left and look at this guy. And I'm driving kind of close to him, so I back up. So now I'm doing one mile an hour. He sticks his finger up and he freaks me up. I don't know, didn't do anything. Yeah, but I'm going to preach the word of God. <laughs> I'm going to, to, to learn. I'm going to teach. And, and this is there, this is put there to, to thwart me, amen? To get my train of thought of what I'm supposed to do. He goes further than that. He pulls over and he gets off and he goes like this. I said, Lord bless you, but I'm just trying to get to church. <laughs> the door ran him and I forgot about it. See, we have to practice these things. We have to practice being the image of God. We have to practice being His love. Amen? Amen. For the love of God to flow through us, we've got to have His patience, man. We've got to have the wherewithal, the resolve that God has so that we can move with Him and step with Him. Amen? And not a step by ourselves or away from God. Away from the attributes, away from the service. And we ought not to talk about something we know nothing about. Amen? Listen, something that we see wrong in someone else is not an opportunity for us to judge them. It's an opportunity for us to minister to them. It's something that we know we need to pray for. And a fellow member, and a pastor, and a brother, and an employer. When we know a fault, then we see a fault. It's not ours to criticize. It's not ours to be sickened. It's not ours to judge. It's ours to be the hand and feet and grace of the living God. The understanding, the wherewithal, the knowledge, the love, the high counsel, like Tory, the high counsel, the humility, the submission to all things. Amen? Amen. When we see something wrong with somebody, that's, that's happening to the good of God for His purpose and His will for our lives. Because in that He's teaching, and that He's showing us patience, us virtue, and temperance. These are the qualities of God. This is what He wills for me and you. To see one like Him, to be one like Him. 
I remember I was reading the issue of the story and the girl with, with the blood issue, when, when she was trying to touch the garment, she said, if I could just touch his garment, I would be healed. If I could just touch him. And the disciples were around me, he's walking through. And he says, somebody touched me. And he said, Master, the said, Master, there's so many people here. So many people touched me. And he said, no, I felt the virtue leave me. I felt the power leave me. The woman touched him, had faith. And I said, man, I wish I could be like that woman. And the Lord spoke to my heart, don't be the woman, be the man. Be the man in the red sash. Be the man who has the garment. Be the man who displays and lives the power of the living God. Be him. Don't be the woman with the problem. Be the one with the solution. Be the one with the anointing. Be the one with the wherewithal who can stand in the gap, who can stand in the way of intercession. Somebody stops you, turn the other cheek. I'll tell you a secret about that. When you give him the other side, you know what? If he stops you with the other hand, that's the ultimate disgrace. Not for you, but for him. And by the times, this is a hand we ate, this is a hand we ate with, but this is a hand we cleaned ourselves with. So if you stop somebody on one side, he gives you the other side, you stop him with this hand, that's the ultimate disgrace. That's the ultimate disgrace. To do it again with the dirty hand. And by the times, that was it with you. And if it was done in public, it was that much worse. The opportunity to turn the other cheek is not an opportunity to shame and disgrace somebody. It's an opportunity to teach them. It's an opportunity to show them how to stand on their faith and on the virtues of the living God. Yeah. Careful what you say. Careful what you post. Careful what you agree with. Because we're going to have to give account for that. In our own lives. Am I who you called me to be? Say it to yourself in the mirror. Am I who you're called to be? The Lord, fix me, straighten me out, discipline me, prune me, teach me, show me. I'm asking for it. Give it to me, hallelujah. Give it to me. Make me like you. Make me like the man in the red sash, hallelujah. The one who brought the power, the one who brought the anointing, the one who brought the word. Be him. Don't be the woman with the problem. Be the man with the solution. Be the man who walks with God closely. Closely. That means I don't say or do anything that the anointing of the Holy Spirit doesn't produce in me. Listen, I got a long way to go to get there. I got a long way to go to get there. But I tell you what, I never stop walking. I never stop fighting. Into the fray. Every day. Told the lie. Every day. You know who's with you, right? You know who's with you. The man himself. God himself, the risen king, the one who defies death, the one who takes the stand of death away forever, the one who makes death a rite of passage for me and you. That's how death glorifies God. That's how death helps and serves the will of those who seek his will and purpose. Death is a rite of passage for me and you. The Bible says to be absent in the body is to be present with God. That's how it works. Death for me and you was a rite of passage. A rite of passage. We will never know death as long as we're in Christ. Amen. I'm asked about heaven all the time. I say this, I only know one thing. I only know one thing. I know the love relationship that I have with God will never end. And that's all I need to know. When heaven comes, how it comes, and what the variables are, who can imagine? I know this, the love relationship I have with God will never end. Never, never, and I can rest there. I can trust God there, right there. I remember Dr. Norizano from the UA used to tell us. People would ask, are we gonna be taken up before the rapture? Are we gonna be, in the rapture, are we gonna be taken up before the tribulation? After the tribulation? Or due to the tribulation? Nobody knows, nobody knows. She said, it doesn't matter. We trust God for whatever happens. I say, yet though he slay me, will I trust him? I've been on a terror lady, teaching people how to put others first. And you want to listen to this? I say, and this proverb is in every religion, you can succeed best and fastest by first helping those around you to first succeed. You mean, let me make sure I understand this, you want me to take what I have, my money, my talents, my hopes, my fear, my anointing, the gifts that you have given me to promote somebody else? Really? Is that what I'm supposed to do? And the Lord says, yes. So I get on a chair and I start practicing this in everything I do and everywhere I go. And I ask the Lord, is this what you mean? 
He said, go a little bit deeper. I said, Lord, I can't stand up already. I'm already having to try water here. So you gotta go a little bit deeper. So I go a little bit deeper. I take money that's mine, I take resources that are mine, and I ignore the failures and faults of those that I'm working with. Like that, Lord, he goes, no, you gotta go a little deeper. Oh, man. Started to get a little nervous, man. So he starts telling me in my heart and my mind, what do you really want? What is it that you really desire? As a matter of fact, as a matter of me seeking his will first, remember that. That's the requisite here. We gotta seek God first, right? Well, you know, I see myself as a pastor, as a minister. Maybe even here. There are stranger things, you know. And he says to me, Dan, what if, what if this thing about helping others get a holy fruit? That means you gotta put somebody before you. That means you have to elect and choose someone else to be pastor other than yourself. You have to give that desire away. You have to give that want away to somebody else to promote maybe Anna or Nate or Mateo to put him in front of me and give him what I want the most. Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to lay down that heart's desire so that somebody else can go before me? And then I start to see. And then I start to see that the God requires of me. When he asks me to deny myself, to show who he really is. And he straightens me out. And he tells me, yes, Daniel, you have to be willing to give that away. You have to be willing to give that that you love and want the most to somebody else. And let them go first. The kingdom of God is likened to this. That the first should be last and the last should be first. I wonder if we grasp it. Think about that. What is it that you want the most? What is it that you think you want the most? And they prepared to give it away like it was nothing. Let me tell you something. It's going to take a resolve in Christ for that. This is going to have to be between me and Him. If I'm going to be able to do that. This ministry, serving God, is going to have to be about Him and nothing else. It's going to have to be about Him and nothing else. Can we get there today? When we come into the fray, do we have that state of mind? Are we prepared to deny ourselves on the highest level? On the highest level. Jesus asked God to spare him. At that moment, at that time, the terror, the fear, the horror of what was about to go down. He did not want that to happen. It was not, it was not what he wanted. He humbled himself to that cross. He didn't give himself to it. He humbled himself by God's command and by God's will to do what it is that he did. Are we willing to do that? The mind of Christ demands it. The mind of Christ demands it. Lay it all down. Lay it all down and put somebody before yourself in an unselfish act that really costs you. That really costs you. What are you willing to give away that really costs you? I've studied 10, 15, 20. I've been a pastor and assistant pastor for 29 years in one capacity or another. I deserve to be here, right? Wrong. We know what we deserve. Judgment. Amen. When we were yet sinners, he loved us. When we were yet sinners, he died for us. When we were yet unworthy, unwilling, and unwanting of him. When we put the nails in his wrists and the crown of thorns on his head. When we ourselves were Judas' kiss, he gave himself for me. Mm -hmm. He died on a cross for me and loved me. And then rose again and said, there's nothing you can do against me. You may as well join me. You can't kill me. You can't ignore me. You can't live without me. He asked Peter. Jesus asked Peter three times. Peter, do you love me? Of course. I'm your man. I'm your boss. Of course I love you. And then he asked him again. Peter, do you love me? And he, yes, Lord. I love you. He's starting to break up. He's starting to get nervous. And then he asks him the third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, do you know? He asked him one time for every time he denied him. For every time he denied him. He said, Peter, you can deny me three times. Don't care what you say. Don't care what you think. You can deny me three times before, before it's all over. Peter couldn't understand that God's love went far beyond his faults all the way to his needs. Far beyond his sin. Far beyond 
to his needs. That God is the same God today. That God is the same one that back then. He's the same one today. He's the same one today. I pray you feel the conviction in your heart to be something you've never been before. To go deeper than you've ever been before. I want to take this time before I close to invite the men from Cross Point back. Amen. It's been a long time since they've been here. We had different groups here. They've been here again. They've been here again. We are to disciple them. We are to love them. We are to nurture them, affirm them, and empower them. That's our job. We are to put them first. We are to put them first. Guess what? We're supposed to put everybody before ourselves. We're supposed to care about them more than we do ourselves. I'm going to tell you this. A lot of people think it's a pastor's job to pray for the people. I tell you what, it's your job to pray for the pastor. It's your job to pray for the pastor. It's not your job to criticize him. It's not your job to call him out. It's not your job to score when he's gone to him. It's your job to pray for him, intercede for him, affirm him, Amen. help him. He's got a tremendous burden. Jonathan, the leadership of him, have a tremendous burden on them. Your burden is to pray for them. Your burden is to help them. Your burden is to intercede for them. Remember that. Your pastor needs your prayers. We need your prayers. I'm out there all the time. And when I'm out there, if I've got your prayers and rocket affirmation, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Every heart, every believer, every prayer goes with me. So that the anointing of the Holy Spirit can flow. Not just through me, but from you, through me, from him to you. Amen? Amen. That's why we're here. To affirm others. Not to criticize them. Not to judge them. Not to talk about them. But to affirm them. To help them. When someone's doing something wrong, get into the fray. Get into the fray of the matter. Get into the fight of the matter. Pray and see God, Lord, how can I help this man? How can I teach this man? What can I do that you would do, Lord? What is your way here? What is your command and your order here? And be willing to wait for it. Be willing to wait on God for what he's doing. Be willing to be still. He that hopes and sees, that's not hope at all. That's not faith at all. That's he who hopes and doesn't see. Now that's faith. That's hope. That's what we stand on. Not what we see. Not what we feel. And not what we think. Put yourselves aside. Concentrate yourself. Consecrate yourself. Set yourself apart for a higher purpose. Something you've never known before. Something you've never thought before. Be changed. Be transformed. Join the fray. The fight. The front lines. Come with your whole heart. Come ready to lose, ready for conflict. Servant leadership says, servant leadership says, conflict is inevitable. It's gonna happen, get used to it, and learn how to operate on that level. Because that's all Jesus ever faced, was conflict. Even within the ranks, these guys just didn't get it. Are you never gonna, you servant of little faith, are you ever gonna learn? It was constant conflict on such a greater level than what we are. Does everything really work to the good of God? Only when we seek His will and His purpose according to the matter. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to deny ourselves to let somebody else have what we want more than anything? Are we willing to do that? Because if we do that, let me tell you something, then we can be the man in the red sash. Then we can be Jesus. Then we can be like Jesus. We'll be denying to give that away that we want more than anything. Give it away today. Forget about it. Let God have His way. Not according to your measure, but according to His. Amen? Amen. I pray you receive this one today. I pray you challenge yourself today. I pray you look in the world and say, Lord, prove me. Lord, search me. Search me. Search my heart. Search my mind. Search my ways, Lord. Because I know I'm offensive. I know I'm iniquity. I know I'm wicked. I know I'm a product of the fall. I need work. I don't get it. I need to walk closer with you. I need to press into you. Or it's not going to happen. I'm never going to have the wherewithal to give away what I want most unless I give it to the Lord first. Unless I give it to the Lord first. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen. Amen. Forget about yourselves. Forget about what you want. Forget about that. Focus and concentrate. Focus your eyes on God. Focus your eyes on the scripture. 
Focus your eyes and your ways on the envelope of the living God. You know your fathers on earth, right? Know your Father in heaven. Know his MO. Know his will. Pray and seek him so that you won't make that mistake of thinking what you're doing is God's will. And yours together? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way, brother. We have to consecrate ourselves today and every day and in every way. Do you understand? Do you receive it? I pray that you do. Thank you for your time.
Jesus left a gift for us in the guise of the Lord's Supper. It's a way for us to commemorate His death and His resurrection and to remember that we have been won over by Him. It's, it's a form of preaching through symbol. The Lord's Supper is available to all who call upon the name of the Lord. It tells us in the Bible, whenever whoever drink, eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Some people interpret that as that we have to come perfect and sinless. But we need to understand that that is impossible. That we can never come perfect and sinless. What it does say here is, is that we must understand what we're doing in terms of this is a very solemn and serious moment. And this is an opportunity for us to renew our vows, if you will. We're baptized one time as a symbol of our acceptance of the gospel and our entering into the kingdom for the, having our sins forgiven, washed away, renewed. But the Lord is something that we do continually to remember, to remind, and to renew ourselves in Him. And therefore, we should examine ourselves before eating of the bread or drinking of the cup. So let's take a few moments now to reflect and pray silently, searching our hearts and seeking God's forgiveness. We confess to you, Lord, that we have not been everything that you would have us to be. There are times we have not acknowledged your presence. There are times that we have looked for our own needs without thinking of others. For these and the sins you see in our hearts, forgive us, Lord, and turn us again to things that matter. Let our commitment to you now become fresh as we remember the sacrifice and celebrate your presence. Amen. The Bible also says that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When they had finished supper, Jesus took bread and said, For I received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. <laughs> you got it. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. The Bible tells us, is this, not, is this not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ? And it's not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we partake of one loaf. As we go into our homes and into the world, I pray God's blessing upon you. And as you go, remember this renewal of your commitment to Him and share the light with everyone you see. Amen. I, faithful to the